This this is also the live streaming. I will just put it here. For the yeah, yeah, yeah. You do whatever you want.
Recording in progress. setting it for yeah may i have your attention please the special lecture will commence at 10 3 10 excuse me so please take your seats and before we begin please know that simultaneous interpretation will be available for today's event please use the receiver device in front of you for korean select channels one and three for Chinese, select channels 4 or 5, and for Russian, select channel 6. I think we are ready to begin a little bit early, so shall we start? Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, welcome to the GSIS Special Lecture. Thank you for joining us, despite your busy schedules. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Puyongmi, and I have the privilege of being your moderator for today's event. First and foremost, I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to Professor Chihuli, Sunny Cho, and Sonia Chu 
and the GSIS staff for organizing today's event. I am honored to introduce our distinguished guest, Dr. Chung Yong Han. Dr. An's illustrious career has been so impressive that it was challenging for me to select just a few highlights to share today with the audience. Some of his significant positions include former chairman of Korea Commission for Corporate Partnership, or KCCP, presidentially appointed foreign investment ombudsman for foreign direct investors in Korea, president of the Korea Institute for International Economic Policy, and chair of the APEC Economic Committee. Dr. An is the founding dean of GSIS and currently holds the title of Distinguished Professor at GSIS. Today, Dr. An will deliver his lecture on the topic, South Korea's Indo-Pacific Strategy and Middle Power Coalition for Rules-Based Economic Order. We will have a Q&A session at the end, so feel free to ask your questions after the lecture. Now, it is my great honor to invite Dr. An to the podium. Please give them a warm round of applause, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm really happy to be here, first of all. I founded a quarter century ago the Graduate School of International Studies at Jung An University winning the award from the Korean Minister of Education. Actually, 80 universities and college applied for the establishment of Graduate School of International Studies, and only nine were selected to receive the government uh, you know, funding. And uh, I was really privileged to serve as the first founding dean of that, you know, this great institution. Uh, today, I'm so happy to see uh, my old colleague, uh, Dr. Jo Sung Il, who succeeded me as dean of this graduate school and uh, also who served as the vice president of this great institution of Chung Ang University. And also, I'm very much thankful to Dean Johnson A, who organized uh, this you know, great program. And uh, I'm you know, so happy that it looks very nice facility, which is very much advanced from those facilities I used to, you know, see when my days of, uh, you know, uh, Dean of the Graduate School of International Studies. Uh, I know that the, many of you uh, measure the, the interpretation and uh, also, you know, global the business studies. Uh, Uh, the topic, you know, I brought up today is South Korea's Indo-Pacific strategy and the Middle Power Coalition. Okay, uh, maybe you know you heard of uh, the many Korean, you know, press treatment of uh, you know, current Yoon Suk Yeol government declared a uh, Indo-Pacific strategy. Okay, what is Indo-Pacific strategy? And then here you know, I'm talking about all of a sudden, you know, middle power coalition okay, for the rule-based uh, the economic order. I'm, you know, very much happy to recall my days uh, as uh, a former chair of APEC Economic Committee uh, while serving as the president of the- Recording Korean stopped. <laughs> okay. uh, Korea Institute for International Economic Policy. I was very much privileged to serve a chair of APEC Economic Committee three years. And uh, you know, as you know, uh, the 
APEC meeting takes place every year and uh, through a series of senior officials meeting abbreviated as SOM 1, SOM 2, SOM 3, and the final concluding session normally attended by the leaders of 21 you know, countries. APEC Economic Committee uh, are working on okay, what we can do about trade and investment facilitation and liberalization, uh, abbreviated as TIP, T-I-L-F. Okay? So because of my background uh, of my association with the APEC, okay, how we can promote trade and investment liberalization and facilitation, which would bring us a you know, benefit and good well-being for all the you know, APEC community members. So on that ground, you know, I brought up the rule-based, you see, actually, trade and economic order. Okay, well, this one, just to tell briefly my background, you know, how the, the colleague already introduced uh, myself here. Uh, let me tell you, you know, briefly about the, the, the uh, Chair of Korea Commission for Corporate Partnership. Uh, that is actually the, my last job, which I served almost three years. This corporate partnership is working for a collaboration between Korea's big companies known as Jebels and the small and medium enterprises, okay? How they can reinforce each other so that the big companies as well as small and medium sized companies can prosper uh, you know, rather than the, the, the uh, uh, throat cutting the, each other. Okay. Uh, you know, I talk about this. Uh, now we face a really multiple global crisis. Okay? Within that crisis, uh, Korea, you know, announced a Indo-Pacific strategy, and then I want to touch upon a, a bunch of uh, mini-lateralism and regionalism is underway in the Indo-Pacific. Okay, yeah. what is mini-lateralism and uh, you know? Uh, regionalism. Well, we're talking about the supply chain resilience. Why supply chain resilience is important, especially you know, during the pandemic as well as post-pandemic years. And uh, you know, we also are witnessing a severe competition between US and China for economic you know, hegemonic the dominance. How? the supply chain resilience uh, has been impaired or how we can promote even the amid of a great competition between the US and China. And then I want to touch upon uh, comprehensive and progressive trans-Pacific partnership. I hope you're familiar with the organization and the regional comprehensive economic you know, partnership. Finally, the, the U.S. Uh, President Biden uh, last year initiated the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, although the United States withdrew from original you know, Trans-Pacific Partnership. And then, you know, let's see, uh, is U.S. and China going to, you know, confront each other, uh, you know, die hard and uh, you know, throat cutting manner, or US and China somehow managing to look for a what I call strategic convergence. Okay? And, uh, and these two powers play a what I call the, the ongoing uh, nationalistic the protectionism. Now, can you see the clearly? The, the, okay, no problem. All right. <clears throat> Then the 
you know, middle powers, uh, okay, the international, political, diplomatic landscape, okay. What do you mean by you know, middle powers? So why did I bring up you know, the role of the middle powers? All right, we are really facing what I call the super uncertain and unpredictable world. You know, multiple crises now on the way. First, the US and China strategic rivalry. I think everybody here in the room familiar with why the US and China, you know, are competing each other. And, uh, you know, adopting tip and tariff for, you know, the imposition of uh, tariff and uh, sometimes, you know, prohibition of uh, some goods and the strategic materials each other. And uh, they do not agree with, you know, many of the global issues. That's why the uh, Professor Joseph Nye at Harvard University, he coined the terminology of Kindleberger trap. Okay? You know, what do you mean by Kindleberg trap? If these two big powers, they compete each other, you know, they fight each other, they do not really pay attention to the immediate global agenda, like the, you know, the weather disasters and, uh, you know, serious weather change, cyber security, okay? If we have only single power, okay, that what we call the unipolar system. Actually, the U.S. Uh, used to enjoy unipolar status many years after World War II, but the China's rise, uh, especially after 1980s, now challenged the hegemonic status of the United States, okay? Having different political systems. Uh, the U.S., of course, plural party system, presidential election system. The China has single party system, okay? So we can see some, you know, uh, difference in the political systems between two powers and some ideological you know, differences right there. And, uh, you know, recently, these two countries, uh, they're really competing each other to gain supremacy in 6G technology, okay? 5G technology, I mean, with the country which possess an absolute advantage in the 5G technology is well ahead of the many of the modern, you see, the high-priced uh, uh, commercial goods and uh, communication network. Now, U.S. thought, okay, U.S. is really ahead of the 5G technology, but however, China has caught up with the, you know, the level of the U.S. 5G technology. Therefore, United States feel that, okay, well, this 5G technology has taken over by, you know, China, and then, you see, the 5G technology is very powerful, the, you see, technology for military weapon development. And for the security purpose, okay, United States is determined to get really ahead of the 6G technology. Okay? Now, China is trying to catch up, again, 6G technology too, uh, therefore, this technological competition is geared to a security, you know, the supermassive between these two great powers. And now, you see, Russian invasion to Ukraine. Well, we're not sure when it's going to be ended. Okay. Well, somebody, you know, say that we face a new Cold War and the uh, U.S. anchored the NATO system vis-a-vis -vis the Russia and China alliance. So, so we, we can see a great, the, you know, military confrontation 
between the US anchored NATO system versus uh, you know Russia and partially supported by China. Okay? The war in Ukraine disrupted you know, food and energy supply. Or eighty percent of the you know gas demand from the European Union must go through the geographical territory of the Ukraine. The war in Ukraine disrupted the energy supply from Russia to European Union. And also the Ukraine is called the, the world of the food. Okay? I mean, you know, ten percent of the global the wheat and the other crucial grains produced uh, in Ukraine. And the disruption of this food supply caused what we call the you know, global the food inflation price. As a result, we can see a really severely hampered you know, supply chain. Here I call geoeconomic fragmentation. Uh, I think about the three years ago, China all of a sudden suspended exporting Chinese urea water to South Korea. As a result, many of the South Korean logistic trucks, you know, they have to use uh, urea water imported from China because of the lack of the rare water, all the logistic systems, uh, you see, you know, you know halted, and uh, we really faced a critical, you know, problems of this uh, uh, disruption of the logistic system. Because of the U.S. and the China competition now, you see, some countries are willing to align with the United States, but some countries are willing to with China. Okay? Therefore, we can see only the big two divisions. Okay? Those countries align to US, those countries align to China. I know many countries uh, along the China's Belt and uh, Road Initiative, BRI, okay? along the, the, the you know, China's Silk Road, okay? many the Central Asian countries are deeply connected with China. And some African states also connected with China. Okay? Well, however, many you know, the, the countries in Asia Pacific is, uh, you know, connected with the United States. So as a result, we can see uh, two great blocks. Okay? So within even these two great blocks, uh, we can see a, a sub-regional, you know, the, the groupings uh, to get over the this uh, supply chain, you know, crisis. Some countries having a strategic materials. For example, Indonesia and Vietnam has, uh, you know, the, the uh, rare earth and cobalt and the nickel. You know, which are essential component to manufacture in you know, automobiles. So, some countries now, especially which possess a strategic raw materials, try to use uh, or even the weaponize uh, you know, those strategic materials uh, to be against when uh, they be you know, opposing the, the rivals. So we can see really divided, you know, segmented uh, sort of the you know groupings and blocks in which like-minded countries uh, you know trade each other while exercising a discriminatory you know the leverage the other countries. Now you know at moment what the Israeli Hamas war, I don't know which way you know, it's going. And it's another big, big, big crisis between the Middle East and uh, you know, Israel plus the United States. And uh, I don't know, you know what's going to happen. The, the 
you know, oil supply from Middle East. Okay. So for I don't know, in my life I'm thinking I have never seen such chaotic, okay, unpredictable and you know dangerous in you know, a multiple crisis. I guess you know you are here, okay, to study how we can resolve you know those uh, the conflict for you know, I think the human survival. This is this stupid. Okay, um, you know, in the middle of this uh, uh, dangerous uh, uh, global the crisis, okay, South Korean government, uh, December last year, the Yun Suk Yeol government announced a de facto a diplomatic manifesto. Uh, what the Korean government calls a Indo-Pacific, you know, strategy. This strategy contains a three core values here: freedom, peace, and prosperity. Okay. Freedom actually, you know, means okay, South Korea is determined to avoid the rule of law and. Uh, rules-based trade order, you know, human rights, you know, so forth, uh, you know, global, uh, the, the, you know, fundamental values, right? And uh, another pillar of this strategy contains a peace component, okay? I mean, you know, South Korea is determined to engage in preemptive prevention of military confrontation. Okay? I know, of course, uh, in Korean Peninsula, as well as uh, in Asia Pacific and Indo-Pacific. And uh, then the peace component also address, okay? Uh, we need to resolve any conflict of interest through a candid dialogue rather than resorting to a military you know, forces or you know, war. And uh, you know, looking at these three components, I think the first, the freedom and peace component are basically same as those Indo-Pacific strategy delineated by the US Department of State as well as U.S. Department of Defense. I think, you know, U.S. announced the Indo-Pacific strategy uh, about now almost uh, what, a decade ago. You know, they changed the name of the U.S. command located in the Hawaii, Honolulu, Hawaii, used to be called the Asia Pacific Command, okay? But now U.S. changed that name as Indo-Pacific Command to oversee you know, the freedom of uh, the navigation uh, through various naval forces, as well as uh, the air and uh, you know combat the forces. So, U.S. is very much concerned about this, you know, navigation of the along the. Indo-Pacific, extending the concept of Asia-Pacific to Indo-Pacific. You know why U.S. has adopted that policy? I know that we have a you know, student from China here, and the uh, United States, as well as uh, you know, many East Asian economies are concerned about the, you see, uh, the military sort of naval, you know, base development along the island in the South China Sea, uh, which, you know, the Hague International Court uh, verdicted that it is illegal. But nevertheless, China kept, kept 
expanding that naval base along the artificial island in the South China Sea and claiming the adjacent you know, sea route belongs to China's uh, a, a sovereign territory, which obviously you know, hinders a free flow of logistic passage. I mean, you know, many South Korean the merchandise and South Korean, you know, import oil from Middle East has to pass through the Indian Ocean and the Malacca Strait, and, you know, and then finally the, the South China Sea to reach you know, uh, South Korea's either Busan or Incheon. And Japan is also very much concerned about this, uh, you know, any, uh, you see, the, the impact on the freedom of navigation. Well, of course, the United States is, you know, also as the guardian of, uh, you see, uh, free navigation along the uh, international, you know, ocean waters, uh, so, U.S. designed the Indo-Pacific concept. But the, here, let me, you know, indicate that here, prosperity component, South Korea added prosperity component, okay? On top of the two pillars created by the United States. Okay, prosperity component, here, South Korea advocates, okay, open, free, and inclusive in the Pacific. No countries you know, should be, you see, be excluded from the Indo-Pacific collaboration you know, the framework. Every country, as far as South Korea is concerned, should be welcomed to join, okay, to play the same common rule and uh, you know, for inclusive regional economic growth and inclusive technology ecosystem. Okay. And China further, you see, of course, are invited as long as China agree on these principles. So Korean concept is much more inclusive rather than you know China exclusive. So I really want to make it you know clear. And uh, then the South Korea declared that South Korea, okay, we are willing to play the role of the global pivotal state. Oh boy, you know, the moment that you, you hear of global pivotal state, how can South Korea can play that? Only US or maybe China can play the role of the global pivotal state, okay? But here, what Korean government means is that the, we have a lot of the international the forums and international, you know, the organizations and meetings going on, South Korea used to take a very passive attitude, okay? But now, Korean government claimed that, okay, Korean economy is near top 10, and we address a fundamental strategic, you see, the, the values of the human, you know, the ecosystem. So, South Korea is willing to participate very actively to produce a global public goods, okay? like the you know, decarbonization and climate change, cybersecurity. Okay? I mean, this is uh, the matter everybody you know, should be concerned about it. Korea will take a very active role. And further, South Korea is uh, willing to share our developed experience with other you know, developing countries in the world. I mean, you know, South Korea demonstrated a very rapid economic growth, okay? What policy we have adopted, how we are able to make it, and uh, we want to share our experience with uh, you see, other fellow developing countries. So on that score, we claim that okay, South Korea will take global, you see, pivotal state 
not in terms of the military strength, but in terms of the software, in terms of the creating, you see, regional, the, the public goods. Okay, I think here, you know, you can see that a lot of this uh, minilateral and multilateral architectures existing in Asia Pacific. And uh, I provided a three basic, you know, subgroups, free trade area, consultation skill, and security architectures, okay? I hope the, you know, I abbreviated here, but the, I don't know, you know, you are familiar with all those uh, the institutional, you know, the, the, the mechanism. Uh, but free, free trade side, uh, you know, uh, CPTPP, uh, I already mentioned that, Comprehensive Progress Trans-Pacific Partnership. Unfortunately, the United States, which, you know, worked so hard during the Clinton and the Obama administration, but President Trump, you know, suddenly, okay, scrapped the TPP, the agreement, right after his inauguration of the uh, you know, U.S. president. As a result, without the U.S., 11 nations now, yeah, included within CPTPP, uh, the, one of the most advanced free trade agreements, okay? And uh, ASEAN, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, okay, in which South Korea, Japan, China are included. Uh, and, uh, AEC, ASEAN Economic Community, okay, which formed, I think, 15 years ago. ASEAN 11 nations is trying to become like the European Union. And uh, then ASEAN plus, uh, you know, Korea, South Korea, ASEAN plus Japan, ASEAN plus China has their own free trade agreement. Okay? This is uh, a free trade, the, the architecture, okay? the most important ones. And then consultation scheme here in the Pacific economic framework, okay? After withdrawing from CPTPP, the Biden actually last year initiated okay, in the Pacific economic framework, excluding China. Okay. I mean, you know, China was not invited at all uh, from the beginning. So in the Pacific economic framework is designed to counter China's, you know, the rise in the international trade and the other uh, the challenges. Chip 4 Act, between you know US, Japan, China, I don't know, the, the US, Japan, South Korea, and uh, you know Taiwan. Okay, DEPA, the digital economic partnership agreement between New Zealand, Chile, and Singapore, only three countries, okay? Because only three countries involved, maybe we could define, okay, this is a mini lateral the architecture, meaning very many lateral architecture, okay? And, uh, you know, APEC, this is, in a sense, a regional multilateral sort of it, it structure. RSCI, the, the regional supply chain initiative, you know, between the, the India, Australia, and Japan, three countries, agreed to engage in the resilient supply chain initiative. Okay, this is in a sense economic side, economic and trade side, but if you look at the security architecture, you know, quad, uh, a, the US, Japan, Australia, India, four countries uh, agreed to carry on the, the regular, security dialogue okay, to monitor and to oversee how China has been doing along the you know Belt Road Initiative as well as China also declared to create its own sea route a parallel to you know 
uh, it, the ground the silk road. Okay? So this quad framework consists of the four countries established to be against you know, China's uh, the PRI and China's uh, you see, territorial, uh, ocean territorial expansion in the South China Sea. AUKUS, Australia, United Kingdom, and the U.S., three countries also agreed to share a military information, okay? I mean, you know, how China and North Korea, for example, are developing the nuclear, you know, the, the bombs and how their military, you know, maneuvering uh, is conducted. And as a CEO, Shanghai Cooperation Organization. I think you know about this, huh? Shanghai SCO, headed by China. Okay. And China wishes to establish its own, you know, the organization against the NATO system, inviting many the Central Asian countries and some African countries, also India, also here in both Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So we can see that the basically NATO and uh, SCO. Of course, Russia is also you know here and uh, SCO to the opposing the, the security you know architecture. So as a result, you know geopolitical and the geo economic fragmentation is inevitable, given to opposing you know, huge rival camps and uh, its own you know, derivatives, as, you know, like this EPA or uh, you know, the, the AEC, something like that. And uh, then here, you know, you can see that, we can see this is a very funny development. Trade, security and the trade nexus. Now, all the trade okay, must be conducted and must be viewed only for from economic benefit, okay? But it's no longer true. Trade now is evaluated. Trade is conducted in terms of the military, you know, security stress. So I call it the security trade nexus logic. You know why? High-end semiconductor, for example, okay, say under three nano level, this semiconductor can be used very high military weapon system, the, you know, combat planes, as well as uh, you know the sophisticated the weapon system. They must include. Very sophisticated, you know, high-end semiconductor. However, semiconductor, high-end semiconductors are also used for you know, AI computing and all the our daily, you see, the, the commercial goods too. Therefore, you know, certain items are used for double purpose, military purpose as well as commercial purpose. We define them as a, a dual technology. Okay? As you know, technology develops, it's very hard to distinguish, okay, oh, oh, this technology is only for commercial purpose or military purpose. There is a very blurry demarcation line between two of them. So as a result, U.S. conveniently now using the security and the trade nexus. And USA said, hey, South Korea's uh, high-end semiconductor cannot be exported to China because of the security reasons. We can see that a lot of the impediment of okay, free flows of goods and uh, intermediate goods under the name of the security. Uh, but unfortunately, the United States, okay, using this concept, 
for its own nationalistic self-interest and protectionism. You know, U.S. really do not pay attention if they adopt a certain guardrails under which you know certain products cannot be exported to China. Many you know smaller economies like South Korea suffers because uh, we are prohibited uh, exporting our you see, semiconductor and uh, high-end semiconductor production facilities to China, like the Xi'an and Wuxi in which you know Samsung and SK are very heavily involved. And uh, in response to U.S. actions, okay, no, China is also saying that hey, you know, we, you know, we should ravage okay, the U.S. actions. So, you know, China, we have you know the what almost ninety-five percent of the global the rare earths and nickel and uh, you see cobalt, which are critical and essential to produce a semiconductor and even yeah, battery for you know. The automatic, you know, vehicles. So we can see that it's just a straight confrontation under the name of security and trade nexus. So here, you know, what I'm arguing is that okay, middle powers you know, less powerful than U.S. and China and economically as well as militarily Japan, India, South Korea, Australia, Canada and so forth we should be united to hold hey, you know, unilateral actions from the US and China is going to damage you see, our own living can, can he make that voice you know South Korea alone you know, cannot make a meaningful you see, impact. However, middle powers, Japan, South Korea, Australia, Canada, you know, we are united and say, saying that to the US policymakers, oh, well, if you have to do this and let's violate uh, global trading system, we are going to suffer. Please refrain you know, from practicing you know, these measures. We can say to the U.S. Also, middle powers, if we can express our collective voices against China, hey, please, Mr. President Xi Jinping, and, uh, you know, please, you see, and do not the, the, the practice uh, exporting strategic materials uh, uh, to, you know, stop exporting real earth to uh, nickels and the cobalt, you know, to South Korea or South Korea's automotive, you know, the, the plant and the semiconductor factories uh, yeah, will be impacted. So that's why middle power coalition is uh, is 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 emerged. Two big powers they play their own game for their own national interest, but the lower a uh, less powerful economies, okay? We should look for our own way of living, okay, to survive. I mean, that's, I think, this uh, very uh, crude motivation of the, uh, you know, middle power coalition. I hope, you know, this sort of attitude will play a very significant role in redesigning international geopolitical landscape, as well as in mitigating direct confrontation between the U.S. and the China. Now, big question arises here. Okay, what is like-minded middle powers? Can Korea, Australia, Japan, India, can it be united very easily? I don't think so. Okay, we have our own national interests, right? But certain specific issue wise maybe if you know middle powers can play a collective leadership we can do something a very unilateral and coercive actions done by us and china
<laughs> okay, you know, trade is, I mean, you know, it's really fundamental, you know, requirement for human survival. China, despite its big confrontation, China must import the soybeans from the U.S. Otherwise, you know, Chinese cannot survive. I mean, you eat, I eat all the tofu almost every day and, uh, you know, uh, I must eat this uh, denjang soup, okay, every day. And, uh, you know, we need to import this uh, uh, soybeans from the China. The, 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 from the U.S. and uh, also, you know, U.S. beef. You know, also, Korea, South Korea also needs China-made low-end chips and uh, photoresistor. You know, I'm really surprised if you look at the, the trade commodity composition between Korea and, uh, you know, China, the largest import items from China okay, to South Korea is that the semiconductor. Although semiconductor is, uh, as far as uh, the, the memory chip is concerned, uh, Korea, you know, Samsung and SK dominate what the almost sixty percent the global supply. But here, you know, one has to see that semiconductors has such, you see. Multi-layered, uh, you know, from the, the low end to very high end. Okay? I mean, the mobile phones and uh, here uh, the uh, notebook do not require uh, the very high end, you know, semiconductors. However, the supersonic, you know, the, the F sixteen, the Bombers and uh, missile systems, uh, oh, they require extremely high-end semiconductors. And uh, furthermore, about seventy percent of the global trade consists of what we call the, the supply chain network, according to World Bank study. Okay, you know, it. it Part and the components uh, across the border numerous times to make a, the, the you know final final goals. Uh, therefore, the crossing uh, the borders numerous times interconnected each other. As a result, the resilience of supply chain is so important. I and mean, you hear every day, you even look at newspaper, okay, supply chain resilience. You know, how we can ensure supply chain resilience. If supply chain disrupted, oh, everything stops right there. And automobile production requires what this about the 10,000 uh, parts and components, okay? I mean, South Korea cannot manufacture all those 10,000 parts and components. Some part must be imported, some part must be imported from China, you know, low end semiconductor. Otherwise, you know, Hyundai, the Kia cannot manufacture us, our own, the, see, the final the automobiles. As a result, and, uh, you know, here all I'm saying is that the supply chain connectivity and the resilience and the smooth flow of the supply chain product is a, a way of economic life. As uh, you see, the shortcut for economic well-being for every country you know involved. I know that the given U.S. pressure on China, China now has turned into what we call dual circular economic system. Okay, oh, China has 14 billion people. Uh, 1.4 billion people and uh, in a huge domestic market. Okay, you know, China could be self sufficient without really going through you see, external trade. No, that is wrong. China must import, you see, <laughs> starting from soybeans and must import, you see, medium and semiconductors. 
high-end semiconductors from you know, the, the South Korea and even you know Taiwan. So I think the, in order to understand international relations and the international you know geopolitical diplomacy, we need to understand the you know, fundamental nature of the supply chain, how each countries are interconnected. If you carry on the you know bunch of these uh, tradable goods from country A to country B, you can see the very interesting you know the, the phenomena from resource rich economy to resource poor economy. Well, there is a you know gravity model to explain this uh, trade balance so on. Uh, and, uh, trade facilitation measures, uh, you know, free trade agreement. I think the everybody the law, but Digital trade, okay? This is, I think, it's a new development. I mean, you know, you do not establish, do not need to establish a your trade liaison office in Beijing, you know, for South Korean small and medium enterprises, okay? Vice versa, Chinese, you see, small the traders do not need to establish a sales office in Seoul through e-commerce and through various digital agreement, you know, the small traders can you know, benefit each other, paperless, and uh, also, you know, time saving, and cost saving, you know, the schemes. This trade, uh, the, the, the facilitation measures is very important. Well, this one, you know, in a sense, uh, the explaining the what I have already said. Yeah. Oh, okay, break. Yeah, break the table. Yeah, okay. All right, okay, good, good. I think the, you know, we are going to a very exciting topic, okay? So uh, take a deep breath, <laughs> take a cup of coffee or whatever, you know, juice, okay? Let's meet up 15 minutes. Yeah. Okay. okay, this concludes the first session. It was personally very intriguing to see how the U.S. and China rivalry is sparking multifaceted geopolitical and geoeconomic fragmentation. Also, I feel like the importance of middle power coalition is overshadowed by the fierce competition between the U.S. and China, but I could see why the cooperation between the middle powers is very important. So thank you for your insight, Dr. An. Now we will take a 10-minute break. Please, excuse me, 15-minute break, and please return to your seats by 4.15. Thank you. Thank you. 
Ich 
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the second session of today's lecture. Did everyone get a chance to take a deep breath and get a cup of coffee? Yes. <laughs> I am very looking forward to learning more about the fascinating topic of the global value chain. And with that, let's welcome Dr. An back to the podium. Dr. An. I hope you had a you know, very good break. And, uh, well, you know, I'm also very much delighted to see the, my colleague, uh, Dr. Kim tae Actually, he is the expert on the middle power you know, coalition. That, uh, I'm afraid to speak on this issue before a, you know, Confucius. I'm talking about the uh, East Asian philosophy in front of the great, the, you know, uh, guru uh, Confucianism and uh, uh, Professor Tejan <laughs> Kim is uh, right. Please, the, the excuse me, okay? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you know, I talked about the, the nature of the supply chain resilience, okay? Uh, and uh, here I define the what do you mean by supply chain resilience at the very bottom of this page. But here, you know, I want to introduce a very interesting concept. Uh, in business terminology, okay, we said, uh, you know, many times, just in time management, okay, abbreviated JIT, JIT, JIT system. In the, you know, automobile, the manufacturing plant, you just cannot see a huge, you know, the heap of intermediate goods, okay. And uh, store the, within the factory inside. Every day, each component and part are delivered on time. Therefore, no need to accumulate inventory. Uh, therefore, we say that the no inventory, you know, management, just in time delivery, just in time, every parts and component are delivered uh, at the assembly line of you know, automobile the manufacturing process. So this is a very important terminology. But however, of course, by doing so, okay, we can save a lot of the money and the you know, cost because no need to accumulate the inventory, right? But now the we don't know what's gonna happen the supply chain, as you know, I explained in the pandemic or the war, uh, you know, unexpected disruption. Uh, will, you know, impair the supply chain system. Therefore, the use of and the logic, they come with very interesting, you see, terminology. Just in case management, okay? Just in case. Uh, you know, supply chain disrupted, okay, we need to prepare. That means what? The only way you can do, you can accumulate the huge, you know, stock of inventory, right? So, I hope the you know you can see we shift from JIT system to now just in case inventory management system. 
a newly emerging phenomena to deal with a supply chain in resilience. Here, and you know, I already did, did mention that uh, on the just in time and the just in case, but the, especially for strategic sectors vulnerable to supply chain, you know, disruptions. Especially you know, the, the, for Korea here, semiconductor, large storage batteries, and uh, users of rare earth producers of medical supplies. Okay. These are really key components. If they are disrupted, all the production system breaks down and uh, you know, no trade and so forth. Uh, therefore, those four strategic sectors are really critical to ensure supply chain resilience. And uh, then the, at the bottom here, I, I mentioned the rare earths, uh, lithium and cobalt, um, manganese, and uh, you know China's BRI, in a sense, uh, motivated uh, by the here uh, uh, securely, the, the, uh, strategically supplying China on the you know strategic materials. So, and uh, South Korea and Japan, I mean, you know, our factor endowment on those strategic materials almost negligible, zero. Uh, therefore, two countries, for example, need to seek out a alternative you know, supply sources uh, to make a strategic alliance with uh, whatever, whichever countries, you know, possess that the you know, materials, especially Indonesia and uh, Vietnam and Australia are uh, strategic partners for South Korea's supply chain you know, resilience. So as a result, we can see that economic interest and the political interest okay, on the security trade nexus uh, are interact each other. And uh, that's why I think this, these days uh, international relations uh, and diplomatic relations uh, must be viewed and perceived uh, uh, on the basis of the security trade nexus. Yeah. And uh, I think this, I hope this uh, Professor Kim Dayan agree with uh, my own assertion here. <laughs> well, <clears throat> Now, U.S.-China rivalry, okay? I mean, in a sense, this is one of the most critical, the, the unstable factor, whether you know, the world uh, can make a smooth transition from unipolar system to you know, uni the, the bipolar or even the you know, multipolar the, the, the system, okay? And, uh, you know, here my Chinese student uh, is already aware of this uh, uh, China dream by 2049 in commemoration of the 100 years of anniversary proclaiming China. What, uh, you know, Pax Sinica is, is really, you know, I mean, and, uh, so I mentioned that the competition between the US and China in the area of the 5G and the 6G, you know, technology competition. And now here in the United States, okay, United States has been the champion of the free trade after World War II, uh, you know, until the, the very recently. And they, you see, did not allow any trading partners involved heavily in the industrial subsidy to promote a specific industry through what they call the industrial policy. Okay. I mean, you know, Japan has adopted a very unique industrial policy to catch up advanced, uh, you know, Western countries at the industrial competitiveness. But however, look at now what the U.S. is doing. Oh boy, you know, U.S. is doing almost uh, a modern version of industrial policy. 
first to give, you know, really very heavy subsidy to gain a absolute, you know, advantage in the most advantaged, advanced technology, especially semiconductor. Reshoring. U.S. is bringing back, bring back their own U.S. origin multinational companies operating overseas, coming back to U.S. Then the U.S. government is giving you know a huge the, the government the subsidy for the uh, relocation and uh, you know the, the management. We call it the reshoring, okay? And uh, sometimes even you know U.S. is willing to see. The U.S. origin multinational companies operating in Canada, for example, even in South Korea, what we call the, the nearshoring. Okay. And the South Korean case, uh, we could say a friend sharing. All right. Although those companies are not able to come back to U.S. immediately, okay, it's still fine to operate in South Korea, and it's still fine to operate in neighboring country, you know, in Canada. So I can see that this is, uh, you know, a revival of industrial policy, which U.S. historically made a very strong objection. Okay? I'm newly emerging, you know, the, the phenomenon in the world the industrial and trade policies. So. And uh, then, you know, I already introduced a Chip for uh, Science Act. Again, the, the enacted uh, September last year with the $280 billion to foster conducive ecosystem for high-end semiconductor. Okay? The U.S. position is that semiconductor is the key for everything, for the 21st industry and 21st technology. As a result, U.S. must regain you know, competitiveness in the semiconductor area, even including manufacturing component. Okay, manufacturing component. The U.S. Uh, used to believe, hey, you know, this can be done in Japan, Korea, and Taiwan. But now, U.S. position has been, you know, really reverted. U.S. want to maintain the everything along the entire production process of the semiconductors. As you know, result, the U.S. established a guardrails against China. You know, I mentioned that certain high-end uh, semiconductors cannot be exported to China, and uh, high-end facilities for semiconductor cannot be, you know, it, it cannot go to China. As a result, the, the China responded with, uh, okay, that's fine, you know, we'll do in our own way, self-sufficiency in, you know, semiconductor. I know that China successfully landed its, you know, spacecraft on the moon, okay? And, uh, you know, in the aerospace, uh, the aerospace uh, technology, China is uh, one of the, the, the leading country. And so maybe China, you know, declared that, okay, if U.S. policy is, you know, going like that, we'll do it by ourselves. Okay. That's uh, what, you know, the competition between two countries is going on right now. Okay, uh, here, you know, CPTPP, most advanced, uh, I mentioned that. Uh, after, you know, Donald Trump withdrew from uh, original TPP, uh, 11 nations, okay, started out as a CPTPP, but very recently, on March this year, United Kingdom has joined you know, CPTPP, so total members now numbering the 12, okay? and uh, CPTPP wishes to expand its total economic side, okay? Uh, in the absence of the U.S., I mean, U.S. used to occupy about, about 25% of the global GDP, and uh, so the size of the CPP, CPTPP has shrunken you know, quite a bit at the uh, withdrawal of the, the U.S. 
So, you know, the point here, you know, I would like to make is that China and Taiwan, you see, submitted the official, you know, applications to CPTPP. When the UF withdrew from, you know, TPP, TPTPP. Yeah. Well, actually, UK, you know, uh, applied for that, but the UK already accepted that. The existing members of CPTPP will evaluate, yeah? okay, each country is ready to join the free trade pact with uh, a necessary legal structure and, uh, you know, opening of the domestic economy. What I call here entry requirement is uh, very strict, very high standard. Otherwise, you know, you are not allowed. It's a con consensus based, uh, you see, the, the, the admission allowance. If no, if any country object, hey, China is not ready. China still, you know, protect its domestic economy and uh, still continue the uh, substitute to state owned enterprises, uh, in particular, China has not resolved labor issues. You know? Labor issues is very important component within the CPTPP. Child abuse, child labor abuse, and also you know labor use on the compressed you see working environment. I mean you know U.S. is talking about the, the uh, China's policy against the ethnic ethnical minority in the Xinjiang and the Uyghur area. Those products, you see, produced at the uh, minority-driven areas are not allowed for international trade. Unless China resolves these problems, okay, labor issues, China is not entitled to enter the CPTPP. But however, China applied for the membership. Well, I hope, you know, China will make it sometime down the road. And uh, so that the strategic convergence I mentioned. And uh, the, the South Korea, you know, I think this uh, domestic process, okay, means interministerial level, we all agree that okay, South Korea should go uh, to join CPTPP, but Yun Sang Yer government is now judging, okay, when we want to submit the formal application. In fact, most of the existing CPTPP members welcome South Korea's entry because we have already a bilateral free trade agreement with most of the CPTPP members, except except the Mexico. Uh, I think the Mexico is the, the, the only country, and uh, then the rest, you know, we have already bilateral FTA, and uh, most importantly, CPTPP was based on a skeleton structure of Korea, U.S. free trade agreement, Korea's FTA. So South Korea is the country which provided basic framework. So CPTPP and the other countries of World Cup. But here, uh, Indonesia, Thailand, the Philippines, Colombia, you know, also wishes to join the CPTPP. And uh, then, you know, CPTPP address Okay, investor state dispute, which I said does not explicitly address intellectual property right on especially on pharmaceuticals environment, you know, labor standard. I already you know the, the mentioned uh, the child labor abuse of course. So a country must see, satisfy those entry requirements to join the most advanced, the highest, you know, free trade pact. And I hope the China will continue to carry on domestic reform until China can meet those entry standards. Uh, you know, I said, partially I mentioned that, indeed, this is a really great 
the news. You know, can you imagine in the middle of this uh, uh, rising protectionism uh, the, due to the COVID pandemic and uh, China U.S. rivalry? If the you know a total what the fifteen countries uh, India uh, you know opted out the last you know, concluding the negotiation round uh, and uh, became effective for the, the, at the beginning of, you know, 2022. And uh, in terms of the economic size, okay, it's bigger than CPTPP. Well, however, uh, the quality of the, the RCEP is much lower than the, you know, CPTPP in terms of the uh, lowering the tape uh, tariff and uh, uh, liberalization of the non-tariff barriers. But cumulative unified rules of origin is just a very innovative idea okay, to expedite uh, intra-regional trade and investment flows. And, uh, you know, self-certification for rules of origin and the reporting system is also Excellent. Yeah, you know, I'm really happy to see that CJK, China, Japan, and Korea are first time in the history of formally connected within the agreed framework, okay, multilateral framework, because three countries member of you know RCEP. Okay. Between China and the Korea, okay, we have a bilateral FTA, but the China and Japan, no. China and the Korea, we do not have bilateral FTA. But however, on the bigger umbrella of the RCEP, although the quality is very low, China, Japan, Korea are formally interconnected. Okay, Three countries, we said, all right, we are ready to abide the rules contained within the CPTPP. And uh, so therefore, you know, uh, upgrading the RCEP, which means China, Japan, South Korea, you see, carry on necessary you know, domestic reforms. And in fact, this is what I want to emphasize when I attend the, the China's uh, is China Institute for Reform and Development you know, seminar uh, the next uh, Saturday. And uh, let's upgrade, you see, the quality of the RCEP, I'm going to request the Chinese authority, okay. Uh, that means, you know, uh, China carry on, should carry on domestic reforms, including the subsidy issues to state-owned enterprises and also, you know, labor issues. Uh, in the Pacific economic framework, well, you know, the Biden's initiative here, yeah. Uh, this is uh, sort of the uh, conceptual with the framework, okay? And uh, this Indo-Pacific economic framework does not deal with uh, a market access. I mean, it, for example, initiated by the U.S., okay? U.S. does not offer any, you see, U.S. market access to the other members. It only deals with a, a rules, okay? and uh, including basically the, the four pillars. Of first, a resilient supply chain and digital trade rules, and decarbonization, tax, and anti-corruption. Okay, four pillars, and the U.S. insists upon. Okay, let's agree on uh, fundamental principles on those four areas, and uh, without you know. The offering uh, any U.S. Uh, the market access. Okay. Well, that's why it's been criticized. Okay. Well, you know, it's just uh, what no action, talk only, and uh, in some sense it's uh, only you know guns, but no butter. Only guns means that it, you know just addressing the rules only, in which every country, you know, should abide, but no immediate benefit, okay? 
And uh, here, the countries involved uh, uh, the, the Korea, New Zealand, Singapore, Thailand, Indonesia, Vietnam, Malaysia, Philippines, and so forth are the members. But this in the first economic framework is it designed from the very beginning to exclude China, to combat the China's rise and Biden's initiatives to strengthen intra-regional you know, rules on those four pillars. And uh, well, this one is, uh, you know, already the, the, the I mentioned and the that here, can you see that the, on the number two, uh, red line, the indicate that not dealing with the lowering tariff, uh, critics are saying that it's only, only, you know, guns, okay? I mean, you know, one has to follow the rules, uh, but no ma market access, you know, therefore no, no butter. Well, you know, I don't know, you know how it's going to develop, but Korea's position is that, okay, Korea wish to involve very four of these you know, pillars, okay, to address supply chain resilience, infrastructure, you know, clean energy, so on, so on. And Korea is going to propose it's our own rule, like, for example, this uh, the digital, uh, you see, the, the trade rules perhaps together with you know, other like-minded uh, countries uh, to form what I call the middle power coalition, okay? Well, India, for example, okay, they here, you know, they don't join the first pillar, fair and resilient trade. You know, India actually is a big, big country, and uh, now in terms of population, India now already exceeded Chinese in you know, population size, the largest, most populous country in the world. And India continue to grow rapidly, will become the third largest economy within next you know, four years. It, it's definitely for sure. And uh, I have been involved in the promoting India-Korea you know, collaborations, but India you know, withdrew from the RCEP and also India does not join fair and the resilient trade. You know, you know why I want to offer you know the, uh, a little bit the background of the India's position. India is huge. I mean, population is the, the largest. Okay, but India's economic structure, if you look at, is service sector you know dominant, small. The self-employed, the you know, the small owner shops, okay, providing various food and other stuff. It occupies almost the 60% of the domestic economy. India's manufacturing sector is very, very weak. No production capacities to make a part and component. If India joins ourself, okay, India is very much fear of a tremendous inflow of the product from China. I mean, India already suffered from a chronic trade deficit against China because India relies very heavily on the parts and component from China. Therefore, if India, you know, lowers the tariff, oh boy, another exodus of Chinese product will dominate Indian market. As a result, Indian you see, manufacturing base uh, would be totally destroyed. And you know, Korea is also registered a, a continuing trade surplus vis a vis India. And uh, Indians now complain you see, all the time when we talk to each other, uh, we suffer from you know, continuing trade the, the deficit against uh, you know, South Korea. But the thing is that India does not have such a manufacturing you know, capacity. Uh, that's why the Prime Minister Modi uh, proclaimed that as making India as his flagship you know, the policy, the, the proposal. Now, 
this is really a uh, key issue. I mean, perhaps the most important highlighting part of the, uh, my presentation today. You know, I talked about this eight destructive consequences of strategic rivalry between the US and China. And then let me, you know, throw out one question. Is China and the uh, US, they can never accommodate each other? They continue to oppose each other for uh, global the hegemonic leadership? If that continues, the world will suffer, and South Korea will suffer, everybody. Okay? And therefore, you see, as a graduate student of you know, international studies at GSIS, I think you should think of okay how we can make two countries uh, to talk each other and to collaborate each other okay to make a peaceful coexistence rather than you see combating and fighting each other and something like that. So you know, ASEAN, China and ASEAN uh, on the uh, the, the you know, uh, what. Right, the left hand side, and then US Japan initiated the CPTPP. Okay, can you see that those what these uh, eight nations Australia, Brunei, Japan, Malaysia, New Zealand, uh, seven days, New Zealand, and Singapore and Vietnam both those uh, you know seven countries belong to both you know trade groups RCEP, FL, and CPTPP. And at the bottom, you know, I mentioned that U.S. initiated the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. Okay, so here are the three forces uh, interact each other. Uh, the key, okay, to resolve conflict as well as to search for any possibility to make a R7 CPTPP. A strategic convergence okay, to make China and the US get along is that the China's entry to CPTPP require for China to carry on high level opening up to meet the high standard of the liberal trade and the investment. Okay? If China continues you know, to do that, I mean, there is no reason why, you see. I mean, the China should be excluded even CPTPP arrangement. Okay? China should be welcomed. Okay, if China joins, U.S. is going to return. Okay, I mean, you know, at the moment the, the Trump and uh, uh, U.S. protectionist oppose uh, the U.S. return to the CPTPP, but the U.S. is going to, you know, will return. Then we can see that very peaceful is the international community in which. U.S. and China both belong to, and so that we can create a truly uh, a very powerful building block for the multilateralism, okay? as uh, you know, that they proclaimed by the uh, WTO. Okay, here uh, you know the, the countries uh, involving in both groups and. Uh, CPTPP, applicant, uh, Costa Rica, Ecuador, you know, a bunch of these uh, mentioned here. Okay, now middle power, okay, here we should raise our, our own voices. I hope the uh, Professor Kim Taehyun, you know, if they agree with me. Against superpowers, unilateral and coercive actions. Uh, under the name of economic security at the expense of smaller economies, less you know, powerful is in countries. Uh, we should unite it. I mean, you know, coalition of like-minded countries against superpowers protectionism. Uh, I listed a few countries here, Japan, Korea, Australia, Canada, European Union, even ASEAN in India, uh, which are sharing Basically, you know, the, the fundamental values of free trade and the democratic the political system. And, uh, you know, we should also raise uh, our concern against the U.S. Inflation you know, Reduction Act, as well as the Chilean Science Act, which discriminate, okay, 
discriminate uh, the, the, the second tier groups uh, export activities uh, and uh, using very conveniently US own logic of security and the trade because this is uh, you know related to security therefore you are not allowed to export you know something like that no we should uh, you know avoid that and then China's action you know what the warrior type to you know the old diplomacy and uh, unilateral and the coercive actions uh, I mean uh, such as freezing a uh, the, the cultural product and unequal treatment to foreign investors uh, and violating non-discriminating you know principles so, well you know here I think the I don't know uh, you know, Korean the sub opera program are not allowed to run in China and I don't know you know uh, you lifted that the sanction and uh, but uh, I think that very recently Chinese authority allowed the uh, individual Chinese uh, tourists you know can travel sign uh, South Korea but the group you see tourism I don't know uh, it's, uh, but I think this uh, you know we should allow okay? Uh, individual tourism as well as a group tourism between China, Japan, and Korea. You know why? Because that is has immediate impact on economic recovery. You know, China, I think at the moment, I mean, your economic growth rate is this year about, about 5% or something like that. South Korea, boy, we are really miserable situation. If we see the growth this year, I think this uh, about 1.8, maybe 2%, uh, it's, it would be great, even you know, lower than Japanese growth rate. Okay? Uh, what is the immediate medicine for economic recovery is that to encourage intra regional tourism because tourists uh, spend okay? and, uh, you know, buying. You see a lot of product, okay? Chinese tourists come over here and South Korean tourists visit China and uh, all between even, you know, Japan. Therefore, I think this China uh, lift all the, this, uh, you know, previous sanctions on the cultural product, you know, television programs and, uh, you know, so forth. And uh, also, uh, you know, national treatment for Foreign investors. So okay, I'm going to you know, talk about a little bit later on, and uh, then I think this uh, all the we should be fully committed to uh, restoration of the non-functional appellate non-functional appellate body of the WTO. I mean, U.S. Uh, has not appointed you know, judges to make a, a functional the appellate body of WTO system. That's why WTO system, you know, uh, has been broken down, and uh, so uh, as a result, in transition, uh, as a sort of the interim device, okay, uh, WTO now is uh, formed a multi-party interim uh, appeal arbitration arrangement, okay? but its effectiveness is very much questionable. Middle powers okay, should press the U.S. and China to find a middle ground by raising the quality of the asset. If we raise the quality of the asset to the level of high standard level of the CPTPP, I think we are at, you know we are at home, okay, in which we can try to combine these two together, and uh, then. Digital economic partnership between you know CJK, other you know the, the RC members uh, uh, also must be expanded, and uh, then the I call it the you know, constructive middle powers. Uh, we should be able to navigate the big two rivalry toward an open rule-based uh, liberal uh, regional system. Okay, why? reflecting the interest of small and developing economies. And uh, so, summarizing, 
okay, middle powers uh, must be able to hear about that called strategic autonomy. Okay? I mean, we've been following, okay, whatever the US said, yes, sir, okay, we'll follow our big brother. Whenever China says something, okay, I mean, South Korea says, oh, yes, we, got, we understand, all right? But now, the middle powers, okay, we are united and uh, to raise our own collective voice in the area for the rules-based and liberal world trading system, world order, okay? And uh, for that ground, we should be able to exercise, we should be able to leverage the strategic the autonomy. Well, the East Asian economic integration, this is, uh, you, know, you know, my love of here in terms of the academic exploration. And, uh, but we have, uh, you know, three different scenarios. Uh, the, uh, China centered East Asian regionalism or US pivot East Asian regionalism or big two compromised or big two muddle through the regionalism uh, or the endangered Asian century. The Prime Minister of Singapore, uh, the, the, uh, uh, Lee Sheng Lung, uh, you know, he, he mentioned in his foreign affairs articles. Many of the East Asian economies, countries, do not want to be forced to side either the U.S. or China. Okay, I mean, most of the East Asian economies want to be a neutral and want to be independent. Okay, not to be influenced by these two big powers. And uh, I mean, that's exactly the, the my logical background of the. Middle Power Coalition, uh, following the Asian uh, Lung's, uh, you know, the, the uh, claim, he said these two powers uh, you know, continue to confront each other. Uh, Asian century will undergo uh, endangered, uh, you know, Asian century. So. East Asian community concept is feasible only through the sort of the middle power, you know, coalition. Well, these, you know, issues uh, already the, the, uh, I mentioned, but the yeah, historical legacy issues, okay, colonization in the war between Korea and China, Korea and Japan, China and, uh, you know, Japan. So, I don't know, you know, our next generation, especially our graduate student here at GSIS, uh, we need to display our intellectual wisdom to leave our historical legacies behind and uh, looking forward for a prosperous, uh, you see, uh, structural uh, the relationship uh, between two countries. And for that matter, I think the, I really would like to say that CJK free trade agreement. Okay, I mean it has been under negotiation in the last what the 14 years, something like that, and but not progress. Okay? I mean in the past four years, first because of the pandemic, second because of the you know China Japan confrontation, and also you know uneasy relationship between Korea and you know China. But I think this uh, since. Uh, CJK are formally connected on the RCEP. That's why I emphasized the importance of the RCEP, you see, membership by three countries. First, historically, you know, connected each other. So if we enliven the strengths and, uh, you know, benefit already the RCEP membership, perhaps we can work on, you know, promoting the CJK FKA is agreement. Well, I think China's progress, I mean, you know, all this and, uh, but the, I don't know, you know, I want to ask my Chinese student here, uh, China's emperor ruled the universe, uh, China centrism, you know, the ideology. I don't know to what extent that this is true. Anybody here, Chinese student can answer my question here? Yeah? 
Well, you know, the, the A.G. Frank wrote a, the, a book, Reorient, Global Economy in the Asian Age. Okay? I mean, Tang, Tang Dynasty, China was definitely, a, 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 you know, global the, the hegemon, okay? In terms of the economic power and in terms of technology. And, uh, but, you know, frankly speaking, Many of the you know, Chinese neighbors, including South Korea, is very much afraid of you see China's uh, attitude of making all neighboring state as a, a tributal you know state as you know Korea used to do that in the you know many history years back. Okay, I mean you see Vietnam, Japan. South Korea and they, you know a lot of this uh, ASEAN countries. Yeah, some ASEAN countries. I think this uh, uh, you know Chinese immigrants, uh, the, the uh, overseas Chinese, uh, you see ruling economic society there. But I think in this context, I think China stays on uh, really rule-based international systems, and uh, you see no matter how small they are. And China can command a really respect, okay, from neighboring countries. I hope my message, you know, <laughs> uh, to be shared with you, and the China's foreign policy can follow this for the benefit of this, uh, you know, universal peace. And uh, you know, of course, the United States, of course, should, you know, need to abandon its own the coercive uh, unilateral actions, okay? Well, this is, you know, very interesting analysis done by the, the uh, Stephen Roach, and actually who is really a Chinese expert, and, uh, you know, uh, great the, the analyst at Wall Street, now professor at the Yale University, and uh, he's been, you know, really, the advocating China's rights, okay, a good friend of China, but his analysis, okay, uh, relationship between the U.S. China, he, he described it historically, okay, what the so I you know presented uh, uh, for your reference, all right. Uh, look at here, you know, I don't want to give up my own you know idea or my own dream. Okay, we set up already uh, APEC free trade area, Asia Pacific, because I served as chair of APEC Economic Committee. And, uh, you know, this was proposed in 2006 in APEC meeting in Vietnam, actually by the initial Chinese initiative. Okay, hey, let's APEC 21 members agree on the free trade area of Asia Pacific, and uh, through we already you know set the idea. Therefore, what we need to do is that to progress that established you know the goals. Uh, well, I you know men mentioned it my own the, the paper uh, right there, and uh, then the two years ago I also you see. China joins CPTPP after meeting all the entry requirements. That is most effective way of to combine RCEP and the CPTPP. Uh, South Korea should play a global pivotal state role, you know, as actively in producing public goods in free, peaceful, and inclusive in the Pacific. Okay? I mean, you know. We are determined, okay, to exclude any particular country. If any country agree on the fundamental, you see, the, the global the values, uh, everybody should be, you know, welcomed. Okay, finally, I published uh, just what the, you know, this my book just came out. Uh, uh, not within 10 days, <laughs> actually, I gave one copy to uh, Dean Johnson here. 
and uh, in which uh, you know, I described, uh, okay, trade, investment, liberalization, and the facilitation of it. It's a tip. Uh, this is uh, the apex, uh, the ideal goal, and uh, this has to be preserved. Uh, here in, in this book, they, I developed that South Korean experience. Okay, South Korea. We used to, you know, adopt impose substitution the, the powers at the very beginning. Okay, we have not invited foreign direct investment. Okay, until the, the mid 1980s. You know why? Because Korea suffered the Japanese, you know, colonialism. Japanese entrepreneurs took everything of South Korean you know, business during colonial period. If we open up foreign direct investment again, and the Japanese will come over here to control Korean economy. Therefore, no more foreign direct investment. However, Asian financial crisis, okay, Korea had no choice to invite foreign direct investment you know, very, very actively to recover from you know, the, the economic crisis uh, uh, during the Asian financial crisis, we uh, resulted the uh, International Monetary, Monetary Fund, uh, you know, the, the bailout financial you know, package. And then, you see, we included the aftercare services for already induced foreign investors, okay? Foreign invest almost one. That's the role I played almost nine years, and I resolved a number of the grievances and problems raised by foreign investors, including investment from China. Okay, you know, Chinese investment investors are very much interested in investing in the, the Midan city area, Incheon, you see, international seaport area, and uh, I invited them to hear uh, their problems, uh, their recommendations, and so forth. Uh, you know, I resolved uh, many, many, you see, complaints raised by foreign investors. And then further, to resolve that problem, we need to amend the legal system, okay? So I recommended uh, Korea's regulatory reform committee to revise, <coughs> to amend, existing rules and enforcement decrees, including the laws, as chair of the regulatory reform committee, to make it Korea more business-friendly economy. Okay. I include that case story, and then I recommended every country okay, should adopt the Korean system, including China. You know, many Korean companies, frankly speaking, suffered a lot after investing in China. Look the, uh, you see, department uh, store investment in China, okay? I mean, you know, they just couldn't survive because of very heavy regulation from Chinese authority. Oh, they wrap up everything and they withdrew from China. And uh, Samsung electronics company, I went to Beijing, okay? And uh, then, you know, during one overnight, Samsung's advertisement, uh, you see, the, the, the electronic board attached to every bus stop in Beijing area. But Chinese authority described everything over one night without even a prior notice. Okay? I mean, this is, uh, this just cannot be acceptable according to, you know, international standard. Right? I mean, you know, Chinese authority should notify something. Okay, because of these 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 reasons, and uh, you know, we are going to do this. Uh, well, maybe something could react. Okay, well, we you know amend this this and so forth. And uh, you know what? When Korea and China, okay, agreed on bilateral free trade agreement, I insist upon. Hey. The free trade agreement must contain a clause in which after services should be included. I mean, South Korea has already, you know, 
I'm doing <laughs> the, the job already, but I demanded China will do the similar things. So the agreement we reached was that, okay, each country will establish a contact point through which registered or informed. I checked while writing this book, okay, how many cases reported from Korean companies to Chinese authorities, just only two, but nothing happened, no actions, okay? And uh, Korean case, you know, numerous cases, uh, if you look at the, the, the books, uh, therefore, you know, my position is that this, I think the protection, okay, foreign investors on an equal basis, like the national firms, that is fundamental principle of WTO, equal treatment or national treatment, okay? China must practice national treatment all the incoming foreign investors. Likewise, every country involving international you know, cross-border investment must practice a equal treatment, most favored nations principle. So that you know, China can convert with you know CPTPP in the, the agreement. And uh, then my another recommendation to Korean government authority, okay. Korea is also very tough to the business because each ministry has different views on certain projects, okay? I mean, you know, they have their own excuse to delay, see, permits and, uh, you know, government officials, especially Minister of the Environment, Minister of Labor, Minister of Home Security. Oh, they don't care about the, what the, the, the foreign investments are doing here. Uh, so we can see that a lot of this, uh, you know, sort of the xenophobic mentality among, you know, some Korea's uh, the, the conservative, you know, the group thinking of, of foreign invested companies uh, making huge profit, eating good bread, and then run away. Okay? That's the attitude that we have. No, that's not true. Okay. You know, Korea's outbound foreign direct investment is about three times larger than inbound foreign direct investment. But you promise, oh, oh okay. It's part of my time, okay? Yeah. Let, let, me just finish. let me use just one minute, okay? And uh, so I recommended the, the you know, UNCTAD, uh, United Nations Company of Trade and uh, you know, Investment, which oversee the global investment treaties, okay? At the moment, there is about 2,000 bilateral or plurilateral investment treaties. I recommend it. OPTAT must adopt my recommendation, okay, in renewing the existing investment treaties. So I don't think I'm providing some global public goods. My final message is that this book is very expensive, but I would like to encourage you to buy the book and to read it over so that I can become rich. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Okay, now. All right, this marks the end of our today's lecture. Thank you, Dr. On, for your invaluable insights into the U.S.-China rivalry, rivalry, excuse me, South Korea's Indo-Pacific strategy and the Middle Power Coalition. Personally, I was very eagerly anticipating today's lecture since this is a topic that we, as AITP and ISP students, encounter and discuss every day. So I feel very privileged to have gained a deeper understanding of this topic. So thank you once again for your lecture. And now we will begin our Q&A session. If you have any questions, please turn on your microphones and ask your question. Um, and those in room 704 and 705 can also post questions through your microphones. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Um, first of all, thank you very much for the wonderful lecture. And also, I would like to take this opportunity to my to deliver my appreciation to Dr. Sanjan for making this event possible. Thank you very much. That was a great insight. Thank you very much. And as our moderator said, RCEP and CPT, TPP are the topic that ISP and the translator students are facing every day. My question is very simple. The key word in your lecture should be the coalition of the middle power. But if one plus one is just two, in that case, the coalition might not be working. So can you 
give a case or can you give us a scenario where one plus one might be bigger than two? Well, I think the in terms of the you know economic impact, and you know, CPTPP is uh, you know much much bigger. Okay, I mean because of the very lower the tariff and the elimination of a lot of non-tariff barriers. Uh, in the Pacific economic framework, okay, this is you know uh, to talk about only the rules, okay, but these rules now need to be negotiated. It's been initiated only last year, mm -hmm. so uh, it's going to see how it's going to unfold. Mm -hmm. uh, therefore, I think this most uh, crucial impact will be from the CPTPP. RCEP, okay, it's fine, but the quality of the RCEP is so low. Although I recognize that the effectiveness of rules of origin, mm -hmm. but however, the, uh, in terms of the liberalization, I think this asset must be upgraded. Yeah. 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 Any question from any challenge from Chinese students? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, sure. Speak loudly, okay? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you so much for the great sharing and insight. Mm -hmm. um, to be honest, I'm more of a business person, and uh, the mutual aspect of politics and business, I believe, is negotiation table. And uh, in your experience, uh, do you have some possible way to shield ourselves from the risk of being gaslight on an intense negotiation table? Uh, well, you know, <clears throat> I have a little bit problem, okay, the, the hearing. And uh, okay, can you uh, could you repeat your question once more, please? Yeah. Yeah. Um, being gaslighted like this on an intense negotiation table, how can we uh, avoid the risk risk of gaslighting? Yes, gaslighting. 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 Being tricked. What was what was the question? How can we avoid being tricked on a um, Negotiation table. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I, I understood your question, you know, correctly. Are you asking how China you know, negotiate in the the multilateral, the, the, like the CPTPP? Is it, could it be, could be, yeah. Because I think it's uh, always the risk for us to be tricky. Yeah. So it could be China or. Uh, it could be China or any other country. But it's, uh, could you elaborate on what you mean by tricked? Being tricked? Being tricked? Yes. And, um, or being gaslighted. I believe like Professor Kim you know the words gaslighted mean uh, saying one thing but doing another thing. Mm. Gaslighting. Gaslighting. Yes, gaslighting. <laughs> Well, I think you know uh, that that is uh, the, the um, very interesting question. If I understood your question, like the you know U.S. take uh, its own unilateral actions uh, towards China. And then, how China should respond? Is, is that the, the, your, your question? Could be, could be, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if, like, the case is only two parties, then. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, you know, uh, I think the first thing is that. 
President Xi Jinping should meet President Biden as often as possible, and vice versa. Okay. And uh, I was really wanted to see that the President Xi Jinping would attend the APEC meeting, which is scheduled to take place, about, I think, sometime later this year in the, in the U.S., uh, somewhere in San Francisco, something like that. But I understand he's not going. And, uh, so two leaders between you know, two countries uh, uh, should establish some you know, hotlines as well as you know, attend a, those summit meetings to exchange very you know, candid views. Uh, I know that this uh, U.S. Commerce uh, Trade Secretary went to China and uh, Tony Blinken, the U.S. Secretary of State, visited China. And I think two nations you know, must meet on a regular basis, despite a great difference on the you know, world system and things like that. Uh, so that the you know Korean president can visit China and also President Xi Jinping to come to China, and President Xi Jinping visit Japan and, and something like that. So the state visit of the great leaders are a big sign of you see at least understanding each other and uh, try to eliminate a. A, the destructive consequences of a continuing you know, confrontation. So I think that's the first thing. By like meeting each other, you know, I mean, negotiation means what? You give something and you gain something, okay? So the give and take process uh, can automatically uh, take place. I mean, that is much better than zero sum game. Uh, that's, you know, the answer you know, I, can, I can provide. I also hope that they can meet as much as possible. Thank you. 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 Sorry, I don't have mic, so I'll just use my natural voices as loud as possible. Um, as you mentioned in the lecture, it seems that as if South Korea is right now in a very difficult dilemma, both politically and economically. So I was wondering, how do you think South Korea should react to stabilize the situation and get the economy back on its feet? And do you think that should South Korea take the lead of as you mentioned, the middle power coalition in the international institutions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, actually, <clears throat> South Korea's uh, power <clears throat> in terms of the GDP and the military, you know, I don't know uh, how much we can exercise our own leverage to unite sort of middle power's opinion, right? I mean, Japan, for example, I mean, no question about it. India, okay, if India is working on new concept, a global south, a little bit deviating from a traditional the third world movement, okay? Because of the sheer population size of India and India's sheer, you know, domestic economic size, maybe India can invite many, you see, country like the India did at the G20 meeting. But South Korea, I don't know. BTS maybe can do it. <laughs> <laughs> I, see. I mean, I think it's, uh, uh, we need to, um, you see, demonstrate a South Korea's, what I call the soft power. Okay? Soft power is, can be determined by what the cultural, you know, product like this, sort of mean, or BTS, uh, you see, I mean, uh, Korean golfers. But the thing is that South Korea's uh, general public opinion okay, is united to respect global values, you know, fundamental to human values. 
and I always admire a, a great mindset of the people, you know, Dutch people and the people in Switzerland. Okay, I mean, they are tiny country. Uh, Netherlands is what uh, just one third of the Korean population or Korean geographical territory, but Dutch people are very much respected. And the people in Switzerland, they, you know, one of those tiny countries was still very much respected because of, uh, you see, the determination to respect a fundamental human value. So I think South Korea, we need to demonstrate, okay? South Korea, no matter what, uh, okay, I mean, we should adhere to, you know, democratic value, freedom, and, uh, you know, human rights, so forth, okay? Uh, so that the, Eventually, you know, uh, we can some yeah. you know, recognition from the global community. <clears throat> because South Korea has a good reputation in the international, both as you mentioned, culturally and public diplomatic. So maybe you think you should South Korea should stand out to take the lead and mm -hmm. arrange, mm -hmm. attract other nations to get together so mm -hmm. that we could build a peacefully, more friendly, mm -hmm. much more friendlier mm -hmm. uh, middle power coalition, mm -hmm. right? Thank yes, you. I think this, you have a very good relevant point. You know, you mentioned the, the public diplomacy. I don't know, here, you know, GSIS students, uh, South Korea carry on a number of the, you know, global the, the knowledge sharing the, the programs, including COICA and, uh, you know, KDI, for example, established the uh, the public policy study and met many of the policymakers from developing countries uh, visit here and enroll a two years program to learn about the Korea's uh, you know, development process uh, in terms of economic policy and how Korea has transformed. So we have a lot of the things to, which can be shared with our, you know, uh, the, the, the fellow countries. I think the, if one country uh, do that well, maybe it could be also, you know, very much respected in terms of the soft power, not necessarily the size of the ODA, you know, ODA Japan, I mean, and for a large, big size of the ODA funding, right? Of course, you know, South Korea will do that, but the uh, sharing, the a genuine, you know, attitude to share development experience, uh, uh, it's also a very valuable asset uh, on top of this, you know, cultural power. And uh, I hope that my book was designed, you know, to serve that purpose. Okay, um, due to time constraints, we will have to conclude the session here. Um, please give Dr. An a big round of applause, everyone. Oh, yeah. 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 Yes, this marks the end of today's special lecture. Thank you, Dr. An, for your insightful lecture. And, uh, you know, Tijan, may I request one thing? If time allows, maybe, you know, I would like to have a conversation with our graduate students as yes, much as yes, as yes, much yes, as possible. Yes, <laughs> Thank you for suggesting. We appreciate that. Okay. Uh, yes, it's just, uh, you know, meeting you and uh, delivering what I think is a really a great, great pleasure and uh, it actually re-energize uh, my own, you know, thought and uh, thinking. Thank you very much for your attention. Come on, please, we will gather for a group photo. I'd like to ask all members of the audience, as well as the interpreters, and those in room 704 and 705 to come to room 703 for the group photo. Thank you, everyone.
<laughs> Let's take a picture, Professor Cho. <laughs> okay, everybody here. You go to the good joke and I don't know.